Conversations about racism have dominated sports talk this week after Montenegro were charged with racist behaviour by UEFA following abuse aimed at England players in the Euro 2020 qualifiers. The racist chanting from home fans was directed at some of the England players, including Danny Rose and Raheem Sterling. It's not the first time Rose has faced this situation on international duty. He was racially abused in Serbia in an under-21 game in 2012. Serbia's FA was fined $85,000. Their under-21s were made to play a closed game. And the issue is widespread throughout the sport. Just last week, Sheffield United women's Sophie Jones was banned for five games after being found guilty of racially abusing Tottenham player Renee Hector. The issues uh, is not new, but is enough being done to tackle racism in football? That's the question for our Impact Minds panel this week. Uh, joining me to discuss this further is sports journalist Natasha Henry, Tejan Hutton, a grassroots manager from the anti-racism in football charity Kick It Out. And from Salford, we can speak to Fabrice Muamba, a retired footballer. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for joining us here on the programme. Um, Natasha, I'll begin with you. I'm, I mean, frankly, this incident was shocking, but not surprising. Yeah, I think we, we all admit we're no longer surprised by this kind of bigotry in, in football, in the world in general. And there were already warnings, um, you know, judging the stadium as a hostile environment for our players to expect that fans may be aggressive and abusive. But obviously we didn't expect it to go to that level. And once again, it's just shocking that at the end of a great performance for England, we're once again talking about racist abuse in the stands and in football. Let's uh, bring in Fabrice into the conversation. Fabrice, as a retired footballer and as a f footballer in general, I mean, when you heard that and when you saw it, it uh, did it come to you as any kind of surprise? Not particularly, uh, if I recall really well. Like, I remember when I, I played for England under 21 in the same stadium, we suffered the same, uh, same type of incident. You know, this time was Gabi Apongoloho when we were playing. So, uh, to me, it doesn't sound no surprise, no, no surprise to me because it's what they're used to in that part of the world. You know, it's disappointing that it's still happening at this DNA. But, you know, what is down to FIFA and, 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 and the football world to do something about it going forward. Tejan, I mean, when you hear uh, Fabrice say something like that, and I'm sure you work with many footballers who say the same, that it's something that we just live with, that we know happens at games. Yeah, it's something that, um, not just from the professional game, but across all um, sectors of football, where um, you go through these incidents and it's unfortunate, but because of the, the lack of response in terms of when you do um, raise it and bring it to the public eye, there's very minimal done about it. And if there is things done, um, it's, it's, it's more or less seen as a token gesture. Tell me what you mean by that when you say the token gesture, because Kick It Out is mar marking its 25th anniversary yeah. um, and it, the whole idea of the organisation was to combat, deal with racism. And I suppose when it was created, they didn't think that 25 years later they'd still be here dealing with the same issues. Yeah, well, to see um, uh, a fine of £85,000 in Montenegro, in this day and age, there's so much money circulating in football. To use money thereof as a, as a, as a punishment factor for me is ludicrous. Um, because money lost today is money easily gained tomorrow. Um, there needs to be deeper thought um, into the, the, the possible factors that you could use to, to combat racism in football. As it stands, um, there isn't a proactive response. It's very much reactive. And when you have reactive response, it's very um, temporal. Um, and that, that's the reason why we don't have any permanent um, solutions today. Uh, Fabrice, what do you think uh, should be done? Well, there's, there's many ways we can look at it. You know, for, for me, I personally feel like you have to de deduct point and just ban them from the entering major tournament. That way, the message is sent strong. You know, the same way, if a fan in England has committed a, a racist crime towards a player, they totally get banned from coming to the stadium anywhere in England. So it's similar that you know you, we should be sending a strong message, and the sanctions should be very severe. Going forward, you know, FIFA and UEFA and, and the FA, everybody else needs to sit down and look, look within themselves and say, you know, what can we do stronger going forward? And, and this kind of accident can't keep happening. Can't keep happening. We can't be coming back here and having the same conversation every three or four months, you know, say racism, this, racism, that. This is 21st century. We should be talking about how well England played and how well the guys went out there to play in under, you know, a hectic atmosphere, but they managed to get the result. But that has been overshadowed from an individual or group of people that's just been volatile towards the players and especially the black players. 
do you think um, you've talked about individual players, but do you think that a national team should be banned? Well, it, 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 it all starts from one person, and then also uh, the, the education has to be sent across the board, and, and the national team or the country where it play, playing, playing in, a, in a major tournament should be uh, addressing this kind of information that if you feel like you're going to cross the line, just remember there is a heavy sanction that will come against our country. So, which means the message has to be if you, if you do this, there's a there's the reaction, and if we can elaborate and be more severe towards it, then you never know what smart you get from going forward. Natasha, do you think in this particular game, this England and Montenegro uh, game, enough was done to deal with this? Not at all. I think one of the really disappointing things for me was the Montenegro manager saying he didn't hear anything. Now, I understand you want to protect your country and, and the nation that you manage, but to completely come out of a blanket denial. We all heard it. People in the stadium had friends in the stadium that heard it. I heard it on TV. So we all knew what was going on. You're not necessarily condoning it, but allowing them to get away with that behavior. And I think also the referees, the officials need more power to say, do you know what? We're gonna stop the game for 10, 10 to 15 minutes. But they have that power. There yeah. are certain steps that referees can take. But it's not as strong a rule taken. as giving a penalty in the box. So referees are unsure what level it needs to get to before they can take players off the pitch. I think football in general, it's not just the governing bodies, it's not just teams and nations. Everyone needs to come together and have a blanket set of rules. And like Fabrice says, we need to deter it. Right now we punish it after it happens, but we need to say if this happens again, you're going to lose three points in a qualifying campaign, which no fan wants to see. And we don't deter it enough right now. And Tejan, you were just saying that the whole uh, reaction to it is reactive rather than assessing the situation. But just to the point about this uh, particular game and, and the referee, I mean, the referee can take certain steps. You know, it can it, it, just talk us through those steps. So there's a three step process that referees are, are um, commissioned to take. Um, this is not just limited to international games, it's across the, um, the, the game of football. The first step is to temporarily suspend the game um, and make a, a public announcement in the stadium to, to try and suppress the issue. The second step is to pause the game completely to try and uh, take further steps in order to suppress the issue. And the third step is also um, to completely abandon the game. Um, so there's three stages you can take um, in order to help control it. And if you can't control it in terms of there being a reduction, then suspend the game completely. Why do you think it wasn't taken in this case? It takes courage for a referee to do something like that. And um, it goes back to the, the essence of our players protected and also our referees protected. Um, as much as players may receive abuse from, from stadium fans, referees are also sub subjected to that also. Um, so the, the idea of a referee completely abandoning the game, knowing that uh, fans have paid their, their hard-earned money to attend those games, um, it's a very courageous step and I don't feel referees feel protected enough to take those steps. Is that correct, Fabrice, that there are certain referees and in general the culture is that you have to have quite a bit of courage to take a stance to stop the game and say this is not to continue? Yes, I, I think everybody, especially the referee, has their power, but also the players can just get up and walk and, and walk away from the game and say, referee, we can't carry on doing this because if, the, if people that is 10,000 miles away from, from the game can hear it and surely you, are that, you that individual in the pitch can also hear it. So if the player can react in a way that it's showing that they are, they are together and then they try not to condemn it, and they're be, they happy to, to, to walk away from the pitch. But should and it come down to the player to take a stand? Well, we, we, we've seen this case before in Italy where you know, a player just get up and, and walked away. And it, it, it happened many times in, in Italy and all because of such a thing. So I think it's, it's all come down to individual and how much, you know, how much they, want, they, they want to send this strong message. You know, yes, we can try to block it, but at the end of the day, you're all, but we're don't all you human beings. But do you think being. that, again, is a, a reactive response rather than changing the culture of, of how players, fans respond to something like this? Well, we also have to remember players have feelings. So we all go out there to play football to enjoy it, but you can't keep calling me names out that I've not done anything towards you. So, you know, I, there's so much I can take to the point where I say, what's the point? What's the point of me running around and being called all kind of name under the sun where I've not done nothing towards you? So, you know... I'll, I'll, just, I'll just bring in Natasha. I mean, Natasha, the point I'm trying to make is should it come down to a player having to stand up and, and take stance against an entire stadium and, and pull away from a game? It shouldn't, but it may well get to that point. I do, I do feel the players are the ones with the power we've seen. 
everything that's transpired since Raheem Sterling posted on Instagram that day. Other players coming out and saying they understand Danny Rose, um, Daniel Sturridge, Paul Pogba, the way they've all supported what he said. They have so much power and so much strength. Maybe we do need one of them to walk off the pitch. I wish we didn't, but maybe that will finally make people sit up and listen and realise this isn't about people moaning that they're getting banter, a word I hate, in the football stadium. This is abuse. It's disgusting. It's abhorrent. And like Fabrice says, players are human first and foremost. I don't want to go to my workplace and be abused by anyone. So why should they? It requires courage, though, doesn't it, Tejan, to, to be a young player, to have so much pressure on your shoulders, to play in a certain way, and then on top of that, have to deal with this. Yeah, um, it, it takes a lot of pressure, a lot of, a lot of courage to, in order to make a stand, especially when you feel like you're, you're by yourself. And I know um, in previous... If you're hearing it yourself, it's, it's and you feel yourself. like the referee, the, you know, the other side isn't actually reacting in any way. That's right, that's right. And I, um, based on the point she was making previously, within the grassroots sets also, there's a, a self-policing system in place because you feel that the system is letting you down, which is 100% justified because the system has let people down. It's going to get to a stage where players are going to start policing themselves, i.e. walking off the pitch or taking stances, because as it stands, as I said, uh, the, the reaction from the, gov the governing bodies is very reactive. Um, and that shows that the, the, the priority that, that is on their list is very, very low at the moment. I know that you deal a lot with education, but I want to ask Fabrice this question as well about education. How do you educate uh, fans, players in, in dealing with this and, and changing this uh, sort of systematic racism that exists within, within football? First and foremost, we live in a multicultural society, which means at some point a black kid will be able to play with a white kid. And at the same time, they will learn about other people's culture, being able to appreciate other people's culture, learn about other people's culture. And then when you come yourself, when you find yourself in a football environment, it doesn't sound new to you or be able to act, react in a very negative form because you're already used to around having people from different countries and skin color and you're able to command with them. So, so as much as we can educate people, but also need people, society needs, society needs to understand that we live in a multicultural environment and Europe it become it's not like it's more a white Europe, it's a whole different Europe as most people would thought, would think. You know, so it, uh, it, it, it that, that there's a lot of work to be done in, from internally and people outside as well. So football football has a major role to play, but everybody needs to be open minded towards it and also learn that it is a multicultural society going forward. Just uh, quickly, uh, Tejan, I mean how do you educate it's not just about football, it's society as a whole. Yeah, um, it's, it, education will definitely start from the top down. So we're talking about the governing bodies, FIFA, UEFA and the FA. And that starts with the diversity of their workforce first and foremost. Um, because in that diversity, you gain understanding, um, experience, um, but also empathy and sympathy. As it stands, um, roughly 13% of the EFA's um, workforce is of an ethnic minority background. For us, for us to feel confident in believing that the workforce itself understands this issue to its, in its entirety, is no, more or less non-existent. Um, and that, 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 that spores over to the UEFA and FIFA also. Um, so to, to get that diversity is a good place to start. Natasha, I mean, you discussed the fact that this particular game between England and Montenegro was a high-risk game. The fact that there are even these terms in today's day and age, high-risk game, where certain societies, certain nations are, are viewed to be um, problematic. How do you deal with that then? I mean, the, the quote I used was hostile environment, but I think it, it all starts in this situation, it starts with FIFA and But there is an UEFA. actual term, isn't there? Like yeah, a, re a high risk course. game. But it, that has to start with them because they're the governing body of the two teams involved. The Premier League can only say control an Arsenal via Liverpool because that's who they run, that's who the FA runs. When it comes to international, it has to be FIFA and UEFA. But as I say, they have to be the standard bearers. They need to work with people and say, this is a real problem. If you don't know how to fix it, ask for help, work with organisations like Kick It Out, work with organisations like FAIR, allow them to come in and give you the education, give you the skills so that we can stop this happening in football. Hudson Odoi, an 18-year-old teenager, had the biggest night of his professional career and his post-match interview was all about being abused by racists. We should be appalled by that. That's not what football's about. Natasha, Tejan and Fabrice, uh, thank you to all three of you for joining us here on our Impacts Mind panel.